I know it's always dangerous to be in the spot before drinks, so I'll try to, I'll try to land the plane. Um, I'll start with a story that will, will date me, because uh, many people in the room may not know about Daily Candy. So Daily Candy was one of the first email newsletters, came on the scene in 2000. It was started by a former reporter named Danny Levy. Um, and it focused on one product per day, and it became like incredibly popular. It grew to 1.2 million subscribers uh, within the first seven or eight years. And Daily Candy was was first. It went from this like hidden treasure, and and soon like if you got in the Daily Candy, it could make your business. And it was responsible for helping to launch brands like Dry Bar and and Nasty Gal. And then everyone wanted to be in the Daily Candy, and they all rushed in, and the rates went up 10x, and you can guess what happened next. Uh, the bubble burst, I think it sold to AOL, it completely um, collapsed because the brands just really couldn't justify their investment for what they pay, what were paying uh, anymore. And so what happened here was a common cycle, I think, that goes on in marketing every day um, was, was complete. And, and the problem is that the cycle's kind of accelerating, right? There's no... Marketing is not uh, inherently good or bad. I think it either works or it doesn't work, and often that is a function of, of price, which changes with supply and demand. So this has been going on forever. People find something, uh, everyone else doesn't know about it, they get a great deal, then everyone else finds out about it, and then they, they crowd in, and now no one makes any more money. And we've been playing this game for, for a long time. The problem is, and the difference is, the speed of this game is much faster now. And uh, the nine-inning game, you know, baseball could learn from this. The nine-inning game is over in a few, a few hours, if not minutes, not, not, not days. So who knows what the largest auction in the world is? Anyone? Wine? No. Art? Good guess. No. Close. Yes. It's digital marketing ads as a marketplace. The, the, it, it is now a hundred billion dollar industry of ads that are sold in an auction format every year. This auction is the exemplification of what I just talked about around the cycle, why, why it goes faster. Look, people get irrational with auctions. Auctions exist because they benefit sellers. In fact, an economist who was so fascinated about how eBay uh, eBay is probably the biggest marketplace, but in terms of category. eBay um, you know, has auction side of the house and it has fixed price side of the house. So he took a look at how do people behave on the same product on the fixed side versus the auction side. Turns out that they pay 90% more for the same product on the auction side of eBay than on the fixed uh, side of the house. So um, auctions don't just escalate price quickly. Uh, they tend to force people to behave irrationally because they don't like to lose, they don't want to lose out to the next guy. And there's a big winner uh, in, in the auction of digital marketing, and that is the, the triopoly of Amazon, Google, and Facebook. So 70% of digital advertising each year goes to the triopoly. It's almost exclusively in uh, auction format. And I always say it's kind of interesting when you think about how many resellers and middlemen and all the people out there who profit from all this digital marketing, which ends up at these three folks who sell directly anyway um, at the end of the day. So what happened after we came out of the pandemic? Well, the auction went nuts. Um, and if you look at some of these prices from 2021, um, you know, just 100%, 198%, kind of crazy. Um, I, I mean, Facebook had, had basically, all of their earnings increases at the time were driven by average cost per ad going up. And I know a lot of you, and I've talked to so many CEOs who told me, oh, three to four years ago, I built my business doing X, name one of these three things, but I couldn't possibly um, do that today. So we talked about supply and demand. These are the sellers of the auction. So who are the big buyers of the auctions? Well, that would be these guys, all the direct-to-consumer companies trying to scale their businesses over the last few years. And so these are, these are their stock prices, and this is how much money they're still losing trying to add customers and do acquisitions um, in this model. So steroid growth uh, never ends very well. I think we've coming off almost you know, five or 10 years now of pretty like steroid growth with startup companies infused by um, pretty cheap and low capital. And you know, it's been mentioned a few times today, but people are looking for what's next, what's, what's sustainable, and how can I move my business there because this stuff isn't working anymore. 
And this really, the solution to this is, is what we call partnership marketing. You know, the, this is a very simple concept of paying for your marketing after you get the sale and, and aligning incentives um, and, and just moving towards outcomes rather than clicks, rather than impressions. An outcome could be a sale, it could be a traffic, it could be a lead. I think increasingly it could even be measures of engagement, um, but anything beyond a click uh, or an impression. A couple of years ago, um, I'm in a, a group in Boston of business owners, and I was approached by uh, Mike Saguero, I knew from his last business about this new business he was starting called ButcherBox, and they want to talk to us about uh, starting an affiliate program for them. And um, we looked at it, it was like 20,000 a month, and we were like, this isn't really kind of big enough for us yet, we tend to work with larger brands, um, so why don't, we, why don't we check back? And he was just looking at a bunch of different things. Two years later, I'm at an awards dinner for this organization in Boston, and Mike's winning uh, EO Business of the Year, and he's doing $2.3 million in ARR a month. And so I went up and spoke to him after. I was like, Mike, how the hell did you go? Did you raise a ton of money? How'd you go from like 20,000 to, 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 to 23 million? And Mike didn't even realize what he was doing. There wasn't a name to it. Like an, in, and, and, and Butcher Box is grass-fed beef uh, subscription service. Um, but he just went around and found people in the paleo community or who were super interested in the product or were interested in the diet and said, look, I don't have any money to pay you, um, but uh, why don't I give you a percentage of all the subscriptions that people buy over a year and we'll give you content and we'll put like your recipes in the box. And I think he probably used Tune, if I can say that here or something like that. And at the time, and he created this partner program that drove like the majority of their revenue totally on an outcome basis, having to pay for his marketing afterwards. His, his partners made a ton of money uh, and he grew a you know, $30 million subscription business in, in two years. Fast forward, uh, they, a few years later, they are now 600 million in ARR, have never raised any money and are super uh, profitable. Now, they have a lot of other different channels now, but um, this is in stark contrast to uh, a lot of the other businesses that we see were drinking at the, at the fire hose of the, of the Triopoly. And I interviewed Mike it's, uh, on my podcast. I put up the QR code. It's one of the most fascinating interviews if you want to hear about a totally different way um, to build a business um, that's focused on, on recurring revenue and scalability and profitability. So I see a lot of fights in the industry around terminology and nomenclature, oh, affiliate marketing's dead, oh, and then people doing partner marketing, half the people in their program are affiliates. Uh, I, I really don't think there, it's really one or the other. I see this more as an evolution, kind of a metamorphosis from affiliate just becoming a bigger piece of this partnership marketing pie, which includes all kinds of stuff, as you've heard today, and the people are speaking uh, in, in the room. But, but it's bringing together two interesting elements um, uh, that, that have not, it's like peanut butter and jelly, they haven't been together before. You know, we, we always had this affiliate marketing model where there was a customer, you had publishers, uh, you had these full service affiliate networks or agencies, they did all the tracking and they, um, you know, tracked through to the merchant and then they paid back, kind of everyone in the room is familiar with this. And then you have the second parallel system for certain partner deals where someone creates a contract, they set up an offer code that leaks and goes into the wrong channel, they have to then create some assets, they gotta get a deal done with business development, someone sends over a spreadsheet, then someone generates an invoice, someone asks for you know, a payment thing and then there's a tax form, like this takes months. And by the time the partner even gets their check, they didn't realize that they were killing it kind of three months ago. And while I, I think the, the whole partner world was super interested in, in, in the technology that the affiliate world had, um, how they were selling it in terms of just 20 or 30% of sales, irrespective of whether the partner was generated from the network or you generated the partner, just didn't make sense to replace all of these processes. And that's where Everflow and SaaS and the other companies that are coming in are providing that same technology that the affiliate industry love and made at scale, but in totally different pricing models that make sense for aspects of business development and partner teams um, to look at using this in, in new ways. So 
What we really see today is kind of everything starting to commingle together. You've got uh, business development, influencer, affiliate, channel network, uh, resellers, referral networks, ambassador networks, all of these things uh, coming together under this one thing that I think will just be called partner marketing or partnership marketing um, going forward. And there's a lot of trends behind this that are kind of exciting and, and interesting. And I'll spend some time going through each of these because I think they, they also deal with some of the things that are coming together for, for the first time. So in terms of new tech, uh, if you're talking five or 10 years ago, your choices were to pay for sort of a lead or a sale. That's kind of where the technology took you. Um, now the technology is sort of much deeper. So when we helped Uber build their program, uh, years ago, um, you know, instead of, you know, the, the, they could pay for a lead for a driver, but there would be so many problems with fraud and quality score and otherwise. Well, they worked to align that technology into their business workflow so that actually when the potential driver figured out a background check, there was a small payout. But three months later, when they took their first ride and swiped that they were done with the ride, the majority of the payout was, was meant. And, and this is this is just a huge change in terms of the sophistication of the technology and how businesses can think about what is the thing I actually value and how do I hook in and pay at those points in my process. As I said, I, I, I think we're actually gonna, I haven't seen it yet, I've been talking about it for a couple of years, but someone figure out a unit of engagement that they're willing to even pay on. Where someone comes and if, let's say it's a, a, a Airbnb and that they know that someone who puts five uh, properties in their uh, watch list eventually has a high probability of becoming a partner, so they're happy to pay out on that. And then that's great for the publisher to get more of a flag that they're generating the right type of activity early on. The other switch, um, I guess it's not really the current, it's kind of the historical environment, but, and, and this is kind of infiltrated or been the same across other areas of programmatic and marketing, which is you had kind of an in-house team and then you had these platforms outside the company and you had agencies kind of working on these third party platforms. And what you had was a lot of opacity, probably because people didn't want them to know that it was all going back to Facebook, Google and Amazon. Anyway, um, you had a lack of control in terms of these weren't their platforms. They couldn't control them. People were spending their money. Uh, the incentives were to spend more money, particularly when they were paying agencies on a percentage of spend. And there was just tons of markup and middlemen uh, uh, in getting in the middle of, of placing these things. And again, this was all sort of auction format. Well, what's happening now is that companies are, are using these partner marketing technologies. They're bringing them in-house, kind of their own name under, under a white label, and they're asking their agencies also to come in-house uh, and work on their program, not on this thing on a third-party network that they don't control. So it's kind of like hiring a contractor to come build your house and work on your house and you own it, even if the contractor goes away. What's different in here is the requirement is kind of full transparency. Who are the partners and what are they doing? Um, it's company controlled. The incentives are aligned to CPA. You might actually give more budget to someone who can meet um, your, your CPA number. That's sort of a reverse auction format. Hey, if you can do $9, I've got a lot more money for you than if you can do uh, $10. And just a lot more direct relationships where if you think about some of the early days of affiliate, it was like something that was brokered and that was rebrokered and a sub affiliate and you had no idea like who the hell you were actually dealing with at the end of the day. I heard a lot of other speakers talk about this this morning. People want to, this is great technology, but they want to know who their partners are. They want to pick up the phone and call them. They want to look them in the face, particularly if they're buying you know, media traffic and know who they're dealing with. Um, you think about like a franchise and, and when you run a franchise, you can't say, oh, I'm gonna open a location, not tell you where it is and not tell you what I'm doing, but just trust me and I'll send you the receipts. You know, I, it makes a lot of sense that brands are looking for much more of a direct business development, uh, open relationship with their partners. We're probably getting tired of hearing about attribution and incrementality over the years. I, I stopped wanting to talk about it if people weren't going to do anything about it. Um, although, you know, again, the technology that, that's emerged today and, and that Everflow has allows you to start figuring out what it is you value and, and, and pay on it, right? There's much more smart commissioning models now in terms of when we're talking to a client and they're telling us all these old school things they know about affiliate, we're like, no, no, what do you value 
and then we'll tell you how to make the technology work to pay that out, right? There's customers that are paying more for new customers. There's other people that are paying for higher order volume or product tiers, where if you hit a certain amount each month, you move into a higher tier. We've had clients who have zero margin products and 10% margin, up to 20% margin products, and they're going to their partners and publishers and saying, here are our higher margin products, here are the ones we don't make money off of, and we're going to commission um, accordingly. And again, this is just a much smarter way to, to partner. The one size rules just don't fit all. Again, if it's 10 years ago, it's lead or sale, and everyone gets 10%. Um, this is just mass customization now. So also talk today about automation opportunities. I think, you know, particularly uh, AI, I think AI will be one of the most important improvements to the industry and technology and one of the most overhyped things as well over the next few years because everyone will say they're doing AI even if they're not. Um, but the areas where we really see the tech making a difference are recruiting and outreach, right? This is a sales function. This is lots of touches, lots of reaches out, lots of communication. Um, we're already seeing a lot of improvement in the ability to do that. Um, publisher matching, kind of look alike. I have publishers that look like this, that are doing well in this kind of program. Who else out there in other programs that, that we work with or my agency work with or my platform has? have the same sort of thing. One of the advantages that we have as an agency you know, with all these programs is, is the ability to look at that data across, uh, across a lot of different programs um, where, where a lot of brands you know, can't do that uh, if they're just looking at their own data and over, and over many years. And then get better, faster reporting. I think we're, we're moving towards you know, a lot of things that we had to do with complicated pivot tables or ask a question will probably be done through natural language search. And I think that's a big area of AI. You just kind of ask it what you're looking for in the data, and it'll bring it back. And then fraud continues to be a, a cat and mouse game. And I think it'll help um, people stay ahead. And just looking at patterns or analysis, like we always say, when a new affiliate starts out, there's a, they're doing well and there's a, they're doing too well, like in the first week or so. And they get two different phone calls um, based on whether they're doing well or, or, or way too well to say, hey, what's going on? And, and, and to the comment earlier, uh, are you a person that's going to answer the phone? My experience in fraud detection over the years and dealing with all kinds of fraudulent affiliates going back 10 or 15 years is that the longer the and more nondescript response they write you and ask to a single simple question, the more fraudulent they are. So it, it, I get four page emails about what they're doing and they read this book and I'm like, can I just have a screenshot of what you're doing and where you're running it? Like, and, and then nothing. So then we turn them off. So new, new partners. Obviously, partners are the lifeblood of any program. And what's really interesting is we, we held this event years ago, uh, a couple years, uh, and we're bringing it back this year, called the Affiliate Giant Summit. It was kind of the heads of some of the largest programs, kind of a mastermind. And you think we wouldn't have a lot to teach people running the largest programs, but one of the biggest things they got away from coming away from that was we're really not doing recruiting. We're, we're kind of the sales team that's sitting there answering the phone when people call, but we don't really spending enough time uh, that we need to looking at new partners, new opportunities, new outbound stuff. Because again, big, big programs get a lot of stuff that, that's inbound, but they, that might not be the most important. So I, I put partners in two groups, the kind of traditional that we know about and then the, the, the emerging. Um, you know, content, coupon, deal, loyalty, subnetworks, lead gen, these are big parts of a lot of existing programs. I'll talk a little bit about the nuance. I don't believe in any, any generalizations in partner marketing around something being universally good or universally bad, because that's usually people kind of using simple tools and thinking in a simple way. For those that haven't spent a lot of time in the affiliate industry, the one distinction here I'd make is between coupon and deal, because they're a little bit different. Coupon partners tend to offer like, 30% off anything, site-wide, kind of optimize the SEO around the brand. A deal partner tends to pick like a specific product and focus on that day, and you will see that product move. You won't see a lot of impact on the rest of the brand. So you use them a lot if you want to move a product versus you want to move the whole store or a whole category. And then we just have all these interesting new things coming into play. I mean, what's great about this is it's hard for your program not to be innovative if you're always talking to new publishers and partners and seeing, oh, these guys are getting into tablets years ago, and now they're getting into, they're going to be generative AI chatbot partners and all kinds of people kind of leading that. 
some of the ones we've seen, you know, business to business, business development deals being done through uh, partner management and software increasingly, rather than having to go the whole business development channel. Technology partners that'll put themselves on your website and do some function and just take a part of the value that they create, whether that's shopping cart abandonment or some other upselling or otherwise. Influencer, more B2B, um, podcasts are coming in the space, channel partners. There's a lot of different um, partner types that have new opportunities. And again, this is why that needs to be a big focus of the team. And we'll talk about the team um, in a little bit. So new tactics. Uh, I, a lot of times it's not necessarily the partner. It's often, um, we'll talk about this, but I'll, I'll say it several times. I think it's, it's, it's how, not if. Like, how do you work with a partner? Or what do you do? Not if you work with them. Um, a few years uh, back, a, as an example, um, and this is about the program also being integrated into the company and people know what's going on with your partner program. It requires some internal PR. Uh, we worked with this company called ModCloth, and Michelle Obama, while we worked with them, was caught wearing a ModCloth dress. Uh, not caught, but she wore it to uh, <laughs> an event, and it was a big deal because it was kind of a down market product versus a Versace product. Well, the Modkoff PR team got all this stuff to the affiliate team, um, and to, you know, the dress, the spec, the links, content, everything. We got it out to like 500 partners and bloggers in the program within a matter of hours. I think 250 articles were written about the dress with a kit and the content and everything. Again, talking to them like their partners, not like their customers. They shared it, and it was almost $200,000 in sales in one day. Not at the time, this wasn't normally kind of an affiliate marketing type um, activity, but it happened because there was a close relationship with the PR team and people knew what this program um, could do. So COVID hits uh, and, and people are shutting down their channels and they got tons of product stuck in the warehouse. Well, we had one uh, company in, in, in the uh, apparel space um, that had a ton of inventory and, and wanted to move it uh, and we said, hey, this would be a really good opportunity to partner with like a deal partner and give them a huge coupon and like let's get this stuff like moving because they were sitting on it. And they actually went up the channel in the management and one of the things that we talked about, and this is often really uh, uh, missed in the space, let's just call it Nike because it wasn't. But um, Nike, uh, if it was Nike in this case, a lot of people may have bought Nike shoes before, but they may have never bought Nike shoes from Nike. So they had a lot of this broken inventory that wasn't going anywhere, and, and it was taking up money on the balance sheet, and we were able to do a really steep promotion, get it out to some specific deal sites who pushed it, liquidate all this inventory, get it all their balance sheet, get the cash in there, but then they got a considerable amount of, of, of new customers for the first time who were gonna be in that database who hadn't been there before. Similarly, we had another luxury brand that had never really discounted before. They're sitting on all this like winter goods and sweaters and all the stuff from COVID that they're gonna have to eat and never sell. Again, took it up the chain to the CMO and said, we know you don't discount, but you're just gonna be sitting on this stuff. So what if we went out to customers with, with a coupon and what if we set up the technology to pay only for new customers or, and the coupon was only good for orders that were $300 and above. Well, their average order value spiked. They got rid of hundreds of thousands of dollars of merchandise that they would have ate. Again, this was a time when people needed cash and it also raised the program's visibility with the leadership team on like how it could work in different ways. No one ever thought of the affiliate or partner channel as a, as, as a liquidation channel. They always thought of a liquidation channel as pull it out of inventory, you know, send it uh, to a, a consolidator who then sends it to TJ Maxx. But by the way, there's no chance of getting a new customer in that or knowing who your customer was. So they also really benefited by uh, new to file customers. As I said before, uh, anytime someone tells me an assumption in the space, I really focus on the how not if, and a lot of times it's because people just don't know what's available. They don't know, they see the rack stuff, they don't know what's behind the scenes. A client will say, well, I don't want to do coupons. Coupons aren't valuable. And I'll say, okay, well, let me meet you halfway on this. I also agree that a made up coupon that's not real that someone clicks on while they're in the cart is not super valuable. And we can work with the technology to, to prevent that. 
But what about if the same partner can push a notification to 20 million people and drive them to an in-store purchase this week? Would you want to do that? And they're like, oh, we want to do that. How do we do that? Well, I'm like, it's the same partner. We just have to have a different uh, discussion on that. Similarly, I've heard a lot of people say, well, we don't want to do loyalty, or loyalty doesn't work, or it cannibalizes. I said, well, did you know that someone like Rocketon can you know, do a lookalike? You can upload a list. We can do a lookalike audience, and they can target new to file customers who never bought from you before that match the same criteria as your certain, certain customer, current customers. Oh, we're really interested in that. Um, th there are all kinds of things that partners can do if you sit down with them, if you spend time with them, if you ask them what, what is new. Um, and, and the irony is a lot of times pe people say, you know, we bring that like, oh, well, who else is doing that? You're like, well, you told us you want to do something that no one else is doing. <laughs> and then we bring an opportunity, and the first question is, who else is doing that? So, so if the publishers want to be innovative, then you need to like, work with them and be innovative along with them. Other things you know, that I've heard. So we had someone who really wanted to target um, millennial, uh, Gen Z buyers, sorry. Um, and they wanted a real focus on that. A lot of the traditional publisher bases skew a little older. Uh, Gen Z is the primary, you know, we all know buy now, pay later um, sites. Well, and I heard someone say earlier too, like everyone's a publisher. Well, they have all the Gen Z folks. Well, they're also now a huge destination site because people log in, they go to pay down, they push an app, they have an offer section. So the team dug in and worked specifically with a wide swath of buy now, buy now pay later for a brand to get them exposure on those websites with them as a publisher and as their businesses were struggling, they were much more interested in getting involved with a publisher. Drove $46 million in revenue through buy now, using buy now, pay later sites as publishers for someone wanting to focus on a Gen Z brand. Another challenge you might not normally kind of on affiliate if a brand you know, comes to you and says, hey, we want to do two things with our, with our affiliate program. Uh, just only you know, new customers um, and mostly like people coming to store. Well, in that case, um, you know, the, the team sat down and looked at specific incentives around new customers and how to target those and how to put those in the system. And then sitting down with Cardlink publishers and setting up campaigns that drove people in the store uh, in, in time and, and you know, almost 1.6 million in revenue and 60% from new customers. So these are the types of things that we like to talk about with, with brands and with clients when they kind of make an assumption of, well, it can't do that, or coupon sites can't do that. Um, it's just a matter of sitting down and saying, what is the strategy? How do we find the partners that match the strategy? And how do we use the technology to match the strategy? And all of those things are doable with the right resources and team. New convergence. Um, so as I mentioned before, we're seeing a huge convergence between affiliate marketing and influencer marketing. Um, and, and I think there's a couple good reasons for that. Um, the first is, it's kind of similar tactics, right? It's, it's, it's a publisher focus. It's someone taking audience and driving awareness um, to a brand. They tend to be uh, top of funnel and more brand introducers. And we see, after the brief honeymoon, we see uh, people wanting to hold the, the influencer space more accountable to performance and, and measurement. I think someone mentioned earlier, and we've seen it too, sometimes they just ask to use the tracking to track, even if there's no commission on it. But I think these um, industries can learn a little bit uh, from each other. So what, what affiliate brings to influencer is this concept of like always on campaign. I think one of the downside of influencer is you run a campaign, you pay them, and then when it's not running, they're not going to do anything. I think with, with, with influencers who are part of partner and affiliate programs, it's always on. They know what their commission structure is. They know what their payout is. If there's something they see that they love that day, they can go promote it, and they know how they're going to get um, paid. And so we see a lot that are interested in this dynamic. Um, it brings this automated tracking and payment. Um, this has really been missing from a lot of the influencer business out there, from not tracked at all um, to you know, no way to know what's working or no way to pay them other than to start having to send you know, PayPal's. Um, and then affiliates always had this accountability and outcome orientation. We're looking at CPA. We're looking at conversion. Even if we're not totally paying on that, we're at least um, looking at it. And what, the, what if, uh, influencers bring to affiliate is this notion of uh, value for content creation. So a lot of people haven't been super successful with trying to reach out to huge influencers and pay them only on a performance basis. And the reason is these folks are 
they're creating content, they're creating stuff that the brand used to have to make themselves and videos and otherwise, and it takes a lot of time and effort, and they wanna make sure there's some baseline compensation to that. And so I think it's, that's driven a lot more hybrid payment models, which I think we'll see going forward. And to be fair, when you think about how much money in the affiliate space has been paid to paid placements over time, everyone always says affiliate's not hybrid. Like, that's not true. Paid placements is a huge part of affiliate budget and, and spend. Um, this amplification of existing content, uh, we're seeing a lot of success. What's interesting is if an influencer posts something themselves, uh, and then the brand pays to amplify that, the performance is a lot better than the brand doing the marketing themselves because people see that as an, an organic ad. So it's been a really interesting uh, opportunity. And obviously kind of more uh, social media than blog and then listicle, younger publisher audience base, kind of different demographic. Again, I think they're both feeding on each other. And bringing that affiliate model to it, right, you know, we'll have a discussion with a brand like this who comes with us and like, look, influencers are working really well for us, but we've got three, this is like an affiliate program with three partners. Uh, we've got three creators who are, are pretty stagnant and they're 100% of our program and it's been that way for a while, but they came to us and we set it up and we don't have the time and energy. We said, well, there's gotta be a lot of other people out there like them and let's go see if we can recruit some smaller ones, but some more diverse ones and, and have them join the platform and, and, and get paid on, on performance. So. The after of that was an always on influencer program. Again, it, you don't have to have a campaign or pay them that day. 500 different micro and nano influencers and, and a much bigger reach. Um, and those, those large ones are still there. They're just much less of the total now and there's new people coming in um, constantly and that's the scalability. And huge bump in revenue and, and a huge drive in conversions, which actually also shows that influencers will convert. You just have to track them uh, properly. So the last piece of this is, is the team. Um, and I think this, this might be one of the biggest opportunities and challenges for a lot of businesses. Most businesses look like the one on the right today. They've got maybe like digital marketing or e-com, there was some SEO or SEM, the affiliate program was always lost somewhere there. Then they have someone doing influencer, they got someone in BD, which actually kind of falls under sales. Uh, and then someone, there's a partnership person and they've got the channel partners and maybe they're using the tech that the affiliate industry is using, maybe they're not, but really disjointed. I think the the, the brands that understand that partnerships gonna be a huge and important channel are showing this by the way they're reorienting your teams. You're seeing more VP of partnerships, SVP of partnerships. I think we'll see more chief partnership officer. Um, with all of these things going under run Ruth, a, a roof, uh, affiliate, influencer, even aspects of business development. I mean, the biz dev team can handle the, the, the very small group of people that are massive opportunity and need customization and wanna go through all of that. But I almost feel like the partner program's the training wheels to see if it's worth all that time of, why don't you just jump on our standard agreement and do this and let's see how it goes. And then we could see whether we wanna spend all this time on a real customized uh, agreement. And then this whole notion of, of channel uh, as well. So that's the top um, of the pyramid. The, the, the problem is, um, it's really hard <laughs> to find a good partner manager. I won't even get into keeping them because that's a different thing, but, but the nature of an affiliate or a partner manager includes some pretty different left and right brain things. You need someone who's creative, you know, it can do campaign development and ideas. You need someone who's customer service oriented and can help onboard the partners and reach out to them and warm them up. You need someone who frankly has a business development, cold call sales mindset who's out there recruiting new partners. And then you also need someone who's good with data and fraud and looking at things like attribution and reporting. And if you've found someone who does all of these things, you have a unicorn and you should probably handcuff them to their desk. Um, but I, I, most brands are finding it hard to find this all in, in, in one person. Um, and that's why you know, they're either building out a team or maybe they'll go to an agency or find a partner who has um, some of that. But, but this is the challenge is that the role itself inherently has some activities that are traditionally very different strengths. So it kind of gives two options. Um, look to uh, internal talent, uh, and I'll talk about kind of where that might come from in a little bit, or look to uh, external talent. 
uh, in terms of people from other organizations who've led affiliate programs or who've led partner programs in the past that, that can come in house. I, I, would, I would recommend if you have a huge program, there is something that happens, and I talk about this in the book, in the partner and affiliate space that I just don't see happen in every other, other channel. And that is, we will get introduced to Sally. And Sally is the new head of the $100 million partner program at Acme Corp. And Sally is like, great to meet you. I'd like to learn as much as I can. I've never done this before. I, I, I always find, I don't think that the Acme Corp would put Sally in charge of their $100 million paid search program or their $100 million SEO program with zero experience. Um, it's just very interesting to us how many times we talk to someone who's doing this for the first time. I think with the right support, it's okay. But just think about how you would treat another channel of the same size with putting someone who's kind of learning on the fly, particularly if they don't have the support of someone who knows what they're doing, an agency, a network, a platform, or, or otherwise. And one of the problems with the talent is we have a, a big supply and demand imbalance. There isn't a certification in the industry that everyone knows. There isn't a Facebook certified or Google certified. And years ago, the networks used to hire tons of people and train them, and they stayed there for three or four years, the full service networks, and then they went off in the world and they ran in-house programs. Those businesses aren't growing. Um, they're not hiring people, they're not training people. So maybe there's like 20 or 30 people that come into the industry like in the US a year through formal tr channels and formal training. There's a lot of people who learn on the job and by osmosis, but that looks very different than Facebook and Google and hundreds if not thousands of people getting formally trained in those uh, platforms a year. And, and, and it makes it hard to, to find this talent. So again, sometimes external, it's great. Make sure they have experience. As you're building that team internally, there are some of those skill sets that you know, potentially could come from other areas. I, look, recruiting, Partners, it is a sales skill as far as we've seen. It's someone who's willing to call, follow up, keep going otherwise. It could be a BDR, it could be an SDR that, that comes from your sales team that wants to try something different. Data and analytics could come from the tech side or otherwise. Uh, compliance and fraud monitoring, people in legal and finance and HR, they love compliance um, if you want to focus on compliance. So you might have some success taking uh, or, or cross-training people from other parts of the organization or giving them some of these responsibilities. But again, if you're gonna give one person all these responsibilities, left brain and right brain, know that the people who are super creative and people oriented and outgoing are really not usually good at compliance and data analysis. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen very much. You're gonna end up suffering on one of those. Our, our solution has been really uh, to kind of solve that talent is to recruit for aptitude. Like look at someone who understands the fundamental principles, is a super fast learner, understands digital marketing, has a good sense of the space, have the training program for, have the basics, but look for fast up and coming learners to, to, to build out the team. We've had far more experience, and, 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 and I say this having the benefit of a formalized training program, which I, I realize a lot of companies don't have, but hiring really smart people and teaching them how to be partner and affiliate managers than hiring someone who came as an affiliate manager in a place running a really low quality program who all they did all day was coupon and loyalty and doesn't know how to do anything else. It's kind of harder to break them out of that mold than it is to train someone from scratch. And then, you know, we saw this for years actually in Europe and, and Awin did a really great job of this in Europe. You know, people would go there for three or four years, then they'd go in-house. There was a big industry of in-house jobs. They'd move up. Um, but then often a lot of people would switch out of being an affiliate or partner because they get to a point where there's just no more senior roles and then they kind of jump into something else. Of all the people I've seen jump into something else, they kind of miss the industry. So I think it's incumbent upon the industry and the people in this room and the roles to make sure that the really good partner managers and affiliate managers, whatever you call them in your company, have upward mobility. They have a path to a manager or a director or an SVP um, because I think a while ago there were none of these high level jobs, so it was understandable people jumping out. There are enough companies now that need these jobs and, as, and such a supply demand imbalance that if you don't have it, people will be happy to swoop in and take your highly trained partner manager on Everflow and, and put them in their organization. So it's very unlikely that you have uh, uh, you know, established career paths for these things if you only have one or two people in your organization. But, if you don't build them, it's just gonna be the cycling of, of talent and coming in and out. 
So there's a couple um, key takeaways. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart. So one of the things that Matt and I wrote in this book uh, like two years ago when we were writing it was that um, in this kind of notion of why aren't we thinking about more things in, in outcomes, it was, hey, the Super Bowl is like the world's biggest branding event, right? 100 million people watch. Someone is going to realize that this could be a really good <laughs> activation event and look at it in a different way. And so I was sitting there, like, jumping out of my chair uh, when I saw the QR code bouncing across the screen six months later after the book came out, and it broke uh, Coinbase's site that so many people clicked on this thing and tried to go to the website. There was another commercial with a kid wearing a T-shirt with a QR code, and people went to the website. Just sort of proving the thesis that even the largest branding event in the world could be used as a conversion uh, event. I, I remember discussing with uh, you know a, a loyalty partner around. Hey, we you know we're th we, if someone gives us a big enough commission, we're willing to run the ad ourselves and take take the risk and 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 drive everyone to our site and take a huge cut of those sales. So I think all 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 of marketing is going to be looked much more through an outcome and and conversion lens. And I'm sure that won't be the first the last Super Bowl ad. But man, that felt really good to to see that. A lot of the reason why people historically in these CMOs, back when you could get a ton of venture money and you had to spend it quickly, um, went to Facebook, Google, and Amazon with, with, with their truckloads of cash was, I always heard it was like a, a fat pipe. It was an easy, they had both the tools and the velocity to spend all your money pretty quickly. As we're seeing before, it wasn't very profitably, but you could spend it very quickly. Um, what, what technology has done in the partner space, I think start to close that gap. You now have the same sort of ability to reach out and, and run sophisticated campaigns at scale using the technology. The difference is, and I think the positive difference is, they come from a variety of different traffic sources and business models and otherwise. But if you had to do them one at a time, it, it, you couldn't spend that same sort of money. If you want to try to execute a million dollar campaign across 500 partners, um, the technology is making it more likely to, to do that. So I, th I, think, I think we're starting to close the gap on partnership marketing being more of a fat pipe. The advantage, though, is instead of a supply like Google or Amazon, where if the price changes, everyone is out of business, it's, a very, it's like owning a single stock. I think on the right, you see you own a mutual fund of all types of different uncorrelated investments that it's very hard for them all to fail uh, at the same time. And last but not least, uh, some of the most frustrating discussions I have had around the partnership channel are about budgeting and money. And let me say that I would never survive working at a Fortune 500 company, and I understand how budgeting works uh, at these companies. They are, they are used to um, having a budget, and if a channel's underperforming, you take from that one, you give to the other. We need to know it in advance, we need to plan. It, you know, the money is just not, hundreds of thousand dollars isn't just lying around. So, so I respect that. But as I say here, if you like paying for 10% for $1,000, like you should love paying 10% for $100,000. Like you should never run out of budget in a well-run partner program. The problem is this takes some internal PR. It takes sitting down with the finance team, the CFO team. I, I remember this really smart woman years ago talking about she took them to lunch like every month. And she's like, this is what we do. This is how we measure it. This is how we need the money. Uh, maybe not every month, but I recommend sitting down, talking to the finance team, explaining how it works. Say, look, I fundamentally need to be unbudgeted. Um, I can, we can talk about like, what reports you need and how much warning you need, but like, we don't want to cut this off if, if, if it's working. I have never met a company that has said, sales team, stop selling. We are out of budget for commissions for the year. Just go home. Like, they would all quit. But I've seen plenty of brands in December say, go to the, the partner manager or go to their agency and say, set everyone to zero. Tell them that we're at 0% commission. We're out of budget for the rest of the year. There is no faster way to piss off all of your partners than to do that and to not get them back. It's literally like telling your sales team to like go home for the year and come back in Q1. They're all going to go get different jobs. And by the way, this is what the publishers did after COVID. Plenty of partners in the middle of COVID when they desperately needed the sales couldn't see through this, turned them all off, set them to zero. And then they were surprised when they didn't want to rush back when things um, uh, turned around a year or two later. So, it, it requires um, some, some delicate discussions. I think you want to have those. Obviously, 
If you get to big numbers, you know, they don't want to be surprised that they need $300,000 more, but that should be an ongoing um, discussion. And, and really, uh, uh, the partner team and the finance team uh, at, at a brand need to become uh, closely connected. So how do you win in a changing game? I think we're moving to outcomes. Uh, I, I think the impressions, and with all the data we have, all the brand selling directly, all the technology, I just don't know why people are going to want to pay for impressions and clicks when, when they can pay for outcomes, and I think you're going to continue to see that preference. Um, when people try to understand this affiliate or partner marketing, or what is the scope or what is the scale, I always say, like, this is like business development plus scalable technology. How, how could business development work if the entire industry was run on technology? It's, I don't, people always ask about the market size. I don't know. It could be a trillion dollar industry. No one's ever tried it before. But that's, I think, where fundamentally going is taking something that was inherently valuable but unscalable and making it both scalable and valuable, which is really exciting and I think is going to lead to a really big industry. And then last but not least, again, anytime you're talking to someone about a program and opportunity, this, this mantra of how but not if, the generalizations just don't work because everything is different, everything can be customized, um, and if, if, if the brand is just can be clear about what they value, then everything can go uh, downstream from there. So everyone should have a copy of the new book on the desk. We have some extras if you want to take some for your team, um, happy to do that. Uh, my first book, uh, Performance Partnerships, was more of kind of instruction manual for uh, affiliate. It was kind of the first book around explaining everything in the industry. A lot of people have used it for training if they have that new person on their team who's never worked in it before. Um, if you want to copy of that, reach out and I can have someone on my team uh, send a copy. But uh, the new information is much more updated. So I know we have a few more minutes. Um, holding you from, from, from the bar, but i uh, love to answer any questions that anyone has. And do you want people to ask him into the mic? I got you him. got it, okay. Who's first? There's always one and then there's five. All right, there we go, back there. We need to reward the first question asked. Don't mess up. So I, I thought it was interesting that you said, um, you seem to be saying that affiliate marketing would be reporting to partnerships in the future. Uh, could you expound on that? Because it seems it's usually within reporting to the CMO. Yeah, uh, that's going to be totally size of company, right? So if it's reporting to the CMO, it's probably going to be a, smart, a smaller company. Um, we're definitely seeing affiliate being pulled out of sort of the SEO, SEM bucket because while it looks the same, it's fundamentally kind of different. But but. A lot, that really depends on, it would, affiliate would, maybe it eventually report up to the CMO, but this partnership role that we're starting to see is kind of a, a hybrid at organizations where it's starting to cover both of these things and it might include everything except for those really big customized business development deals, but everything else that has sort of a partner and a payout and a tracking element to it. I had another que uh, question that's somewhat related. What do you see the role of what we would call community and how it's changing the landscape for affiliate marketing and influencers? I think, um, especially with AI, content has only become more and more pervasive, right? And we yeah. see a lot of sort of market data that says people are looking to their personal networks and to communities when they want to decide what to buy. Have you seen that in your work already having an impact in terms of what affiliates and, and what influencers are the most successful today? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think someone said it before. We are about to be, someone I heard recently say, do not trust anything anyone ever tells you anymore online unless you see it like personally face to face. Because with, with AI, we're just not gonna know whether someone said it, wrote it, or, or, or otherwise. So look, I think it's an opportunity. We are all about to be deluged with more nice looking crap than we ever want to read in our email box or website or otherwise. And to me, this is an op actual opportunity for be authentic for people to build a community, to build a trusted following, to not focus on quantity, but to focus on, on quality. And I think those influencers and those publishers that do that really well, um, there are going to be a whole bunch to try the SEO game. I feel like when you do something for the wrong reasons, you end up getting punished by Google eventually. But they're gonna try the tons of content and AI and SEO and how can we convert and otherwise. Um, the problem is, 
if, if AI just summarizes all of that stuff, I think like sites that just focus on lists and stuff are gonna have a really hard problem. So they're gonna suck all that data in there. It's gonna be the long form content, the, the community building where you should trust, where people go to that destination first. Um, you know, you might ask, uh, I, I can tell you, my, 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 you might ask AI, what are the top five restaurants in, in Chicago? But my wife is not going to go dress shopping on, on text-based AI. She's going to go look at what X, Y, and Z are wearing that she trusts and follows them and see what the, the trends are. So I, I, I agree with you. I, I actually think, you know, one of the great things about this industry, I always tell everyone, is half technology and half human. I, I think that the, with the tech side being sped up, I think the human side actually even becomes more important. Uh, so you uh, you touched on this earlier. So uh, like some of the legacy networks like CJ and ShareSale, you mentioned that they're not growing. But I wonder what's your thoughts on you, like you want me to repeat that? Last well, year. I'm just wondering why. <laughs> I'm wondering why do you think they're still around, or like what's why do people still use them? Why do people what still use them? Like why are they not like in more decline? Because it does seem like there's still a lot of activity on them. Yeah, there's a lot of activity. There's a, there, there's a lot of brands that come in. There's people that have used them for years. You know, you always have the no one gets fired for Microsoft. I think there are some people that are attracted to the managed service plus technology. I've written pretty openly that I think that that's a conflict of interest. Um, I don't know anyone that hires Google to be their paid search agency or Facebook to be their paid social agency. Somehow the conflict is clear there, but in, in affiliate people have looked at it differently. So. Um, yeah, there's a lot, of, the, 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 a lot of people do different things. Frankly, I think a lot of people don't have uh, the in-house resources, and they just hear that they should do it. So the, the proposition of we can handle this all for you is, is attractive. Whether, whether that's actually creating value, it's a different, different question. I, programs that no one's paying attention to don't, don't tend to grow that robustly. I have a question in regards to uh, utilizing deal sites uh, to acquire customers. You mentioned yeah. the example uh, during COVID when uh, inventory was, uh, you know, burning a hole on the balance sheet, so to speak, yeah. and moving that inventory obviously makes sense to get cash. But um, I, I'm curious, you know, downstream after you've acquired the customer, generally when you get somebody at a discount, they're not as high quality of a customer down yeah. uh, down the road. In the example that you mentioned with the, the luxury brand, where you increase cart value. Um, by having a minimum there, that sounds all well and good, but I'm kind of curious what happens to those customers uh, in comparison to uh, like normal customers, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't have a good answer to that. I, I haven't seen that data, but you know, I'm sure that they're thoughtful in that. A lot of these brands, you know, they're segmenting their CRM, they have outlets, so maybe that group does better when there's an outlet sale or something that they're going to push. The interesting thing ab about the, the, that example of the, the luxury customer was that they bought higher than the AOV. It was just that the discount lured them into it because it was never on that. So I, I don't think that they would look any different because they, were, they, they clearly had the ability to spend more than uh, or equal the average customer. They just like, if it wasn't on sale, why were you gonna buy winter clothes in May of COVID if you didn't need it, right? So it was more of an inducement to probably pull that purchase forward. Um, yeah, one, one more. Last question. One you more. Why you got to be first? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, can you expand upon uh, the point you made, where you know you want to have somebody build your house, so you know you still have your house, uh, as it pertains to building private partner programs? So, if a brand is building their own private program in house, um, do you have you noticed that that trend? How old is that trend? Is that accelerating? If so, at what speed? Like maybe maybe touch on that. Yeah. I, um, I had a slide, I don't have it here, but it looks like what it used to, slide, uh, used to look like when you signed up for a program with all this co-branded network stuff and what it looks like now, which is it's mostly about the brand and then it's powered by you know, whoever the, the software company is in there. So I think the majority of these things that are starting now, particularly not on networks, are labeled partner programs. They are inherently in-house, right? You own it, you own the tech, you can keep it. You can fire your agency and keep it. That's the other thing with the network. Your, your, your tech and your manager are all in one. And I've never seen a manager at a network say, oh, the tech over there is better. 
<laughs> right? They're not going to do it. So it, it, it's totally decoupled. Um, you own it and, 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 you, and you keep it. Um, so that, that's the difference. But you can see this in the evolution. 10 years ago, if you went to sign up for a program, there was more branding about the network than there was about the program. Some of these programs today, you might not even know which software is powering it when you go to sign up. Are we out of time? Am I getting the flag back there? We got one more? One more? Any more? <laughs>